I never in my wildest dreams would I have thought I would be presenting this type of a seminar because a few weeks ago, none of us had heard of coronavirus, perhaps, and uh, now we are quite well versed. Um, I want to give a special thanks to Alexandra Lee. She's one of my dietetic interns I currently have. And also joining us today are uh, Rachel and Melissa. So if you give me some really tough questions, they are standing by to look up further information. I'm going to be very cautious in how I answer my, your questions of me today because we are only giving research-based CDC, FDA, USDA guidelines. You might be seeing a lot of really scary things showing up these days on Facebook and in different areas. And I really want you all to consider the source of the information. In fact, Facebook is starting to crack down a bit on some of the ads that are going out with misleading information. And I just read that this morning. So be cautious. If you're looking for good information, cdc.gov is where I would send you. So today, I am not an infectious disease specialist, first I will say, but I will do a quick review of COVID-19, um, what we know about it, and then we're going to talk through how to protect ourselves, um, especially differences between sanitizing and disinfecting and some of these words that are thrown out. Because we're cooking more at home, probably for some of us than we ever have in our lives, we're going to go through some of the basics of food handling. And then finally, I will wrap up with some resources that we have free for your use on our website. So I've listed some of them below, but I will talk through them a bit more. Um, as Bob said, if you have questions as we go along, please go ahead and um, type them in the chat box. I'm not gonna keep my eye on the chat box and I don't have my video on because I distract myself when I'm, <laughs> when I'm smiling back at myself. So again, I thank you for being here and we're gonna get started. So, um, came upon some interesting things as we were preparing for this slide presentation. Um, you've probably become very familiar with the word COVID-19. The actual name for this virus is SARS-CoV-2. And SARS was a disease that spread very widely in about 2003, especially in Asian countries. So as they were naming this virus, uh, they wanted to take into account that earlier issue and they gave it the new name COVID-19. But SARS, in case you're interested, this will be your new thing you learned today, perhaps, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus. So Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome is what SARS is. And that's the technical name for coronavirus or COVID-19. There actually are many, many different types of coronaviruses. So what do we know about it? We all are very aware that this is a respiratory illness that can spread quickly from person to person. And that's the, the thing they're especially worried about. In North Dakota, I am living in the hot spot, Cass County. I'm actually on campus, but I'm the only one on my floor. So I'm as socially distant as I could be. I think there's one more person down the hall, but they're a long ways from me. Um, this virus that causes COVID-19 is a novel coronavirus. It's a new one. And it first was identified, as we've all heard, in Wuhan, China. So let's talk a little bit more about microorganisms and microbes. We're not going to go into great depth by any means, but what happens with this particular virus? It attaches to cells in our lungs, which is why it's causing such severe issues and many, many deaths and a lot of tragedy and sadness throughout the world. Unlike bacteria and other types of viruses like salmonella is a type of bacteria and norovirus which you may have heard of associated with cruise ships those types of viruses survive stomach acid and can multiply in the gut so they they operate differently we can get over these it's suffering because of the types of illness it causes but those do not cause the same symptoms as this respiratory virus 
In fact, there's no current evidence that COVID-19 sickens people through their digestive systems. And as I was looking up some additional information, uh, I did learn that the virus has been detected in feces, but it's unknown and probably isn't linked to sickening anyone at this point. But that just gives us more reason to wash our hands. And we're gonna talk more about hand washing um, a little bit later. So there is some speculation, as you may have heard, that COVID-19 emerged from an animal source, perhaps bats. But currently, it's spreading from person to person, mainly from these respiratory droplets. So this is why we should all be keeping our distance. And some of the latest guidance does tell us that we should be wearing these masks. And they can be masks made at home. So that was fairly recent, like in the last day or so that the CDC said, you know, wear a mask and that's more to protect, you know, it's to protect you and other people, but you know, it's something that you might want to consider. Certainly not, man not mandated, but there also are a lot of patterns available on the internet if you want to make your own. So what happens? The droplets are produced when the infected person coughs, sneezes, touches a surface and that surface is not disinfected. So that's how we can spread it from person to person and why we're hearing so much about keeping these surfaces clean. For example, I went to a restaurant, I had to be about 20 feet from the place where I could pick up my food and leave and we were all in a long line with six feet between us and the person who was giving me my food had, I practically had to take it off the end of a, a handle on a mop <laughs> it was it was a long ways away which they were following really good good rules and they also sanitized the countertop immediately after um, I picked it up so again when people are within about six feet of each other the droplets could could land in our mouth or our nose another way it could be spread is through touching a surface that an infected person touched and then that person touched their eyes mouth or nose so you're probably hearing a lot, don't touch your face. And that's really good advice as well. Uh, the problem here is that you could be spreading this if you were infected before you showed any symptoms. But that's not usually the main reason. It's usually an infected person and the droplets. So this is all information I'm sure you've heard over and over, but this does come directly from CDC and it's really important for us to to think about all this and be aware of these, these sorts of things. So this was some interesting news and I've seen it spread on social media in case you've seen this information about how long this could potentially be stable. I do want to let you know, and please remember this, that this was unpublished data and it was actually in an editorial to the New England Journal of Medicine and it was not peer reviewed. So the good evidence-based research that we use in academia and you know, hopefully throughout the entire extension system across the country is that we only want to, to give you information that is evidence-based and it's gone through all this peer review. So according to this unpublished data, it could potentially live up to three hours in aerosols on copper up to four hours, cardboard up to 24, plastic two to three days. But you know, take that with a grain of salt. If you touch something, cardboard box, and you're worried about it, simply wash your hands. Just wash your hands with plenty of soap and water, you're gonna be fine. You don't have to burn the cardboard or do anything severe. It's just that hand washing is the most critical step. Uh, I hope that you're all supporting your local businesses. Um, food delivery is thriving, and that's a good thing because when this is all over, hopefully, um, we'll have all those great food businesses to support and join together again and enjoy that food. Um, be a little mindful what the food is delivered in, and if desired, it's not required, take some extra precautions. So for example, I've uh, seen this suggested that you might remove the food like a pizza from the box and then just get rid of that packaging, use your own plates and utensils and then wash your hands before eating. So 
that is one way. It is not a requirement, but it's just an extra precaution. Uh, someone asked the lifespan on fabric. Um, it's another Julie. I have not read that. I will put my students on that. So Melissa, Rachel, Allie, see if you can find that answer on the lifespan on fabric. Certainly, if you are making a mask, you will want to clean it in some way. And, you know, hot soapy water in a washing machine. Some people have also suggested um, dampening it and putting it in a microwave oven. Hopefully it won't start on fire. Uh, but those are a couple of things that I've seen. But you certainly want cloth masks to be, to be cleaned. So next we're going to talk about uh, protecting ourselves and our loved ones from COVID-19. Uh, every day I, I watch the early and late news and you know it's, it's really sad to hear these stories and you know see all the suffering that a lot of families are going, for, going through. Um, unfortunately at this time there's no specific vaccine or specific treatments or drugs but they certainly are looking for answers. So there are scientists all over the world trying to get a handle on this. But um, of all the steps in mitigating it, cleaning, washing our hands, surfaces is the most important. And of course, avoiding contact with others while sick and just keeping that general social distance for a while until this has been mitigated. So again, washing your hands, I've been saying this for my entire career, and finally people are listening. Thank you. <laughs> uh, really important. And uh, I'm going to do a little activity with you. Just um, So be ready, because you're going to mime washing your hands. All right. Well, first we're going to go through the steps, though. And I have my little phone out here, and I'm going to time us in a minute. So stay with me. So the first thing you want to do when you wash your hands is always to wet your hands first. You wet, use your you know, clean water, of course, and then you apply soap. Probably the most common error that people make when washing their hands is applying soap first and then turning on the water and then washing them. So you do need that moisture. You need to wet your hands first. And then you really want to concentrate and lather the front and the back of your hands between your fingers, under your fingernails. If you were with me in person, we have a neat activity that we do called the glow germ or the glitter bug. And that's where you know, most extension offices actually have this equipment. But with the glow germ, you can see where you missed. And in the hundreds or thousands of people I've done this activity with, most of the time they miss their fingertips and their thumbs. So think about how you handle food, how you touch things, you use your fingertips and your thumbs. Um, an easy way to do this at home, maybe if you're homeschooling kids right now, is you can put some oil on your hands and put some cinnamon on it, have them rub that in and go wash their hands, go and stand in a window, wherever you see those little cinnamon specks, that's where they missed washing their hands. So that's a, very easy way of doing it and it doesn't have to be cinnamon it could be nutmeg or some other spice that you can see so important to wet add soap lather and then scrub for at least 20 seconds um, finally we of course wash our or we rinse our hands under clean water and then dry with a clean towel or an air dryer depending on where you are so I don't know if anyone has ever made you do this before, and you certainly don't have to do it, but I'm going to time everyone, and I have my stopwatch out. So when I tell you to start, I'd like you to rub your hands together, and when I say stop, I want you to stop. I could have you sing happy birthday if you wanted, but we won't do that. So let's go ahead, hands together, start. longer than you think. We're at 10 seconds. Keep rubbing. It's about the time to sing happy birthday twice or Yankee Doodle, whatever song you like, and stop. That is 20 seconds. So as you are washing your hands, and I hope you're washing your hands more than you ever have in your life, <laughs> um, please 
do the full 20 seconds because that is the research-based length of time when you have that soap to remove germs, whatever is on your hands. You could always wash longer as well, but most people do not do that full 20 seconds. So again, hand washing is not only the best defense we have probably against coronavirus along with our social distancing and other things. It also is our best defense against the flu and other contagious illnesses like the common cold. So how often should we wash our hands? A lot. So these are just the general guidelines for washing our hands, certainly before and after eating, putting our hands toward our mouth or face, before, during, and after preparing food for ourselves or others, and particularly if there's someone in your house that you might be bringing food to who has a cold or some other flu or illness, um, really important to keep your hands washed. Um, before, as I said, tending someone who's sick, after coughing, sneezing, or blowing your nose, after using the toilet, or assisting children, babies, after changing diapers, or helping a child with the toilet, after touching garbage, after touching your pet, pets are great at this time of our life, or handling animal waste. I'm sure you can think of other times as well, but hand washing, again, significant for preventing illness of many types. And I can't emphasize enough that the importance of that full 20 second time period. Well, we've been hearing a lot, a lot, lot, lot about hand sanitizer. And I talked to a microbiologist who's done research on this topic. And I asked her what she thought of all this pushing of hand sanitizer. And her response was plain old hand washing with soap. And it doesn't have to be antibacterial soap. That's one thing I didn't mention. It's just soap, <laughs> your favorite kind of soap. Um, but hand sanitizer is a backup if you don't have running water and soap available. It, using too much san hand sanitizer can really dry out your hands. And it also gets rid of some of those common defense mechanisms that we already have on our skin. The pH of our skin, for example, is kind of a protective device. Keep in mind that that hand sanitizer should be at least 60% alcohol. And again, you, you need to rub your hands together for at least 20 seconds. So not just spread it on your hands. You actually are supposed to keep rubbing your hands until everything's dry. That's part of the mechanism of killing the germs that are on our hands and that alcohol basically um, inactivating those, hand, those, those germs on our hands. It doesn't get rid of all kinds of germs and again, it's, it's a secondary defense. Hand washing is more important than hand sanitizers. But you know, if you can find hand sanitizers, I think they're going to come back into stores because they've been all bought up. Um, certainly something to keep on hand and a good pinch hitter for uh, inavailability of water. Okay, so this is another piece that I've seen floating a lot on social media. All kinds of recipes for homemade hand sanitizers. They're all over. Um, I'm going to caution you. Um, the FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration, does not recommend preparing homemade hand sanitizers. There have been trips to emergency rooms because of the chemical burns that have occurred with these homemade preparations that probably some of the substances in some of the recipes was not meant to be in contact with our skin or not repeated doses of it. So, you know, put those recipes aside and, you know, get out the old soap <laughs> and, and use your water and commercial hand sanitizers if you have one available. All right, I'm going to take a quick sip of tea. And next we're going to talk a little bit about washing produce. I've been getting a lot of questions in the last couple of weeks during this huge outbreak about whether people should throw all their fresh produce in the sink with plenty of soapy water and, you know, 
treat them like dishes, I guess? And the answer is no. Um, I do have a follow-up question though. So I told you not to use soapy water, but should you clean firm skin fruits and vegetables like bananas, even if you don't consume the skin? So in the chat box or with your yes or no button, indicate yes or no. Okay, I'm seeing lots of yeses. And uh, thanks for that. Um, according to the Food and Drug Administration, we should clean firm skin fruits and vegetables even if we don't consume the skin, including bananas and any, any type of produce. So the current recommendation is to rinse all fresh produce under running tap water. You don't need any special detergents if it makes you feel better to you know, use a produce wash, it's certainly not gonna hurt you, but current guidance is running water. And those pre-washed bag salads, if you like those different mixes that are available, uh, those have already been washed. Usually they've been triple rinsed. They might even have some added, you know, some kind of very tiny amount of chemical added to ensure their safety. You can use those right out of the bag. If you're worried about someone else who touched the bag before you, uh, simply put your bag of salad in a bowl, discard the plastic, and wash your hands. So again, we're not recommending, or I'm not seeing that as a general recommendation to wash down cans and packages and all these sorts of things. Just keep your hands cleaned after you touch things if, if you're worried about that. Uh, what about all these detergents and bleaches? Um, keep in mind that these types of products are not intended for consumption. So if you were to use a detergent, like your dish detergent, so you're going to use Dawn or Ivory or something like that, those are not meant for us to eat. <laughs> um, they could cause negative side effects, um, could include diarrhea, could include lots of different things. So we don't want you to do that. Instead, the current recommendation for cleaning fruits and vegetables are these following seven tips. And we do have a nice handout that goes through this on our website and we can certainly, I can give that to Bob and he'll link it for me on the Field to Fork archived webinar. And in fact, if you're interested in this presentation, I do have some links within it. We did post the PDF file uh, that you can download and print off or look at more in the future. That will also be on the Field to Fork website if it isn't there already. So again, what are the seven steps for washing produce? We have lots of steps for, don't we? Um, you wanna wash your hands. We practice the 20 seconds, we got that down. If um, damage or bruising occurs in that fruit or vegetable before you eat it, uh, cut away that damaged part before preparing or eating it. And the reason that we don't wanna eat the, the bruised areas, say the bruised area of a peach or banana or whatever, or you know, some, some type of fruit, apple. Microorganisms tend to thrive in those bruised areas. And so you're really cutting away that potential growth of mold or bacteria or whatever it happens to be that is maybe causing the problem. So generally you can just cut that away. Uh, rinse produce before you peel it. So if you're peeling an onion, this, this might be surprising to some people. I'm gonna suggest that you wash that onion before you take off that outer stuff and then wash it again. And by washing, I mean rinsing, not wash with soap. Um, you don't want to transfer that dirt or bacteria from the knife onto the fruit or vegetable. So this is just general food safety uh, as we're cooking more now and that type of thing. Um, if you pick up a head of lettuce or cabbage, uh, best advice is to remove the outermost leaves because usually those have been exposed to, you know, who knows what in the garden and so on. So just, just dispose of those, wash, rinse in um, running water and proceed. Um, fifth, sixth, and seventh steps, you can read as well as I. Uh, rub the produce under plain running water. No need to use soap. Really no need to use a produce wash unless you want to. 
Um, there's also no great advantage in adding other things like vinegar or lemon juice or whatever. It won't hurt you. Um, in fact, the same gal that I talked to about uh, the microbiology of skin also did studies on uh, rinsing produce with vinegar and lemon juice, and there, there wasn't a big advantage to, to doing that. I mean, it's really not going to hurt you to do it, but your vegetables or fruits could actually start tasting like pickles. So if you like that, you know, go for it. But it's not really doing you any good on the food safety side. Um, if your produce has dirt on it, certainly a, a vegetable brush to scrub firm produce like melons and cucumbers would be a good additional step. Make sure it's clean and um, you know run under running water. And then dry it off with a clean paper towel or clean cloth and that also further reduces bacteria. So that is the latest advice and greatest actually from several years now. So you did not see in this that we are suggesting that you throw your food in the dishwasher or in the sink or whatever. That is uh, not a current recommendation. And I will add, all of us should probably be eating more fruits and vegetables because only 10% of adults meet the recommendation of four and a half to five cups per day. It's really good for you, strengthens your immune system. So that message was brought to you by the nutrition side of my job. Um, so next I want to talk through some more steps and I'm just going through some of the basics of safe food handling because that is the main message we're getting through today. Um, there's no specific coronavirus food safety rules because food safety and coronavirus are not linked. Um, in fact, there's, there's not any need to do more than what I'm telling you in the next few slides. So in the chat box, I've got a couple questions for you. And the first one I want you to answer first, how long is perishable food safe at room temperature? So if you had a salad sitting by you for lunch, how long would that food technically be safe at room temperature? Okay, I'm seeing the right answer. Um, actually, there are potentially two right answers. Uh, two hours is the usual amount of time we tell people for perishable food at room temperature. If it were really nice and warm outside and we were out having a picnic and it was 90 degrees or higher, I would tell you one hour. So we want to remember this time and temperature relationship and to refrigerate perishable food within a reasonable time. And that's generally within two hours and even less. So as soon as you're done eating, put it away or serve it on ice or do something to maintain that cold temperature. Okay, your next question. Uh, what are the three ways to thaw food safely? And you can list one or two or three. In the fridge, very good. Microwave, cool water. Boy, I've got the choir on this one, and I'm preaching to you. <laughs> you got it. You got it. That's that's all correct. Refrigerator, cold water, and microwave. If you thaw things in the microwave, say a pound of ground beef, you're going to make for dinner, but you decide you're going to change your your menu. I would suggest that you cook that meat and then you know, put it in your fridge and use it tomorrow or whenever. Generally, when we thaw food in the microwave, meat in particular, we, we start the cooking process. So the best advice is thaw it right before you're going to cook it in a microwave. So um, these are the basic steps that all of our extension staff have done many trainings on, and I see several of them on the call. So hello, everybody. Uh, remember that germs can spread easily around the kitchen. So, you know, hand washing, just as we've already talked about, is really, really significant in preventing all sorts of things, including foodborne illness. And we want to wash our utensils, our cutting boards, our countertops. I will be talking with you next, I believe, about um, sanitizing and disinfecting and some of the differences. Uh, we talked about rinsing 
fresh fruits and vegetables under clean running water and so on. So that's part of this whole step called clean. Clean is the first step in four steps to food safety, clean, separate, cook, and chill. Um, think about the social distancing concepts with your food, <laughs> I guess, when we, we get to this avoiding cross-contamination. Um, so for example, we don't want to cross-contaminate raw meat, poultry, seafood, eggs with ready-to-eat foods like cookies and fresh fruit and those things. And as you buy food in the grocery store, I want you also to think about where you have your food in your cart. So you don't want to put your meat package on top of your apples, for example, and you all know that, but just keep them socially distanced from each other within your cart. Um, when we are grocery shopping, there's just some things I also want you to think about. Um, many stores now either sanitize your grocery cart for you or they provide sanitizing wipes and use those. Use those sanitizing wipes, um, wipe down your cart, you might want to wipe down the seat area, whatever in the babies might sit. Um, but they are doing a really good job about that. I don't think I have it on this slide set, but another thing to think about, which I learned, is that many stores are not allowing you to bring in reusable bags anymore. So that's because you could bring in bacteria on your own bag. So if you are going to a store where they still allow you to use bags, keep in mind that those bags should be washed as well. Uh, I've you know, I don't like using plastic bags myself, but because of the stores where we shop, we now are using the plastic bags for that reason. Um, I talked about keeping the raw meat, poultry, and seafood away from other foods, breads, other ready-to-eat foods, and keep them uh, separate in your fridge as well. So when you put your food away, you want to be cognizant of where you have your food so that you couldn't possibly have meat juices dripping on other foods. So again, just some, some concepts of how bacteria can spread and you know, other types of microorganisms. Uh, but when we get into the meal prep area, this is a good thing. If you don't have these, I think they're really cool. <laughs> um, many places offer color-coded color cutting boards for sale. And I, I think that's a really neat concept. Certainly any cutting board can be cleaned and sanitized, but these color-coded ones can always keep you in mind that red is gonna be for your raw meats and yellow is gonna be for fresh fruits, green might be for vegetables. You can come up with your own color-coding scheme, but that's just a, a neat trick that a lot of restaurants use. And you know, as we get into grilling season and it gets nicer and warmer outside, also remember one of the most common types of cross-contamination occurs when people, say, bring food out on a plate or platter to the grill, and they cook the food, and then they put the food back on that same contaminated plate or pan. So we want a fresh plate um, to do that. Otherwise, you have another issue with cross-contamination. Um, cooking, cooking is, um, is how we can kill germs and bacteria. So the norovirus I mentioned, the salmonella, if we get the food to the safe temperature, you will kill those bacteria, those microorganisms. If you don't have a food thermometer, please get one. They're not very expensive and they are a device that can help protect you and your family from foodborne illness. So just looking at the color of the food or the texture of the food is not a great way to know if that food is cooked safely. In fact, there can be premature browning that can occur depending on if that ground beef package, for example, has been frozen meat. It, frozen ground beef, for example, typically will turn brown sooner than meat that's never been frozen. So the only way to know for sure that that ground beef has hit the magic temperature of 160 internal temperature is to use a calibrated food thermometer. So, you know, you might wanna check that, the calibration of your thermometer by simply putting it in an ice slush, uh, half ice, 
have really cold water and it should read 32 degrees. So these are the magic temperatures for safety. And you don't have to memorize these. All you have to do is go to our website and we have lots of handouts all about safe cooking temperatures and so on. And if you are cooking food in a microwave oven, be sure to cover the food, stir and rotate for even cooking because there can be hot and cold spots in microwave heated food. So cooking will kill viruses. Now I don't know that they've tried it on coronavirus, but uh, most viruses are need a host to live on. That's the difference between bacteria and a virus. And um, they actually die pretty easily with heat in general. So the different norovirus, for example, the type of virus that causes hepatitis is easily killed by heat as well. So the final step in our clean, separate, cook, and chill is chilling. And so I have an assignment for all of you. <laughs> um, check your refrigerator temperature. If you have an appliance thermometer, I want you to check it that it's at least 40 degrees or lower. Um, low temperatures slow the growth of bacteria and they don't kill bacteria, they can continue to grow. But you also do not want to overstuff your refrigerator. And again, we talked about refrigerating these perishable foods within two hours or one hour if it's 90 degrees and you're dining outdoors. Um, another thing to think about in terms of food safety as you're cooking at home, never defrost food at room temperature. I know that some people like to put it in their sink or on their counter or whatever. Uh, what you're doing is allowing that food to be in, a, in the temperature danger zone where we could be growing some bad bacteria or even toxins that you might not be able to kill with cooking. So got in the fridge and those steps that we talked about that I've got on this slide. So those are the three main steps, and I think you hit them all. All right, so there we have the four main steps, and there's a website, ag.ndsu.edu slash food, and again, reiteration of those four steps to food safety. Oh, here we go. We often see tuna grilled and served when the flesh is pink. Is that safe to eat? Um, see, there is a difference when we are talking about a whole mussel, it could be tuna, or uh, roast beef, and that actually can be pink, and that roast beef can be pink inside. In fact, with the right temperature time combination, it can be safe. With a whole mussel, most of the bacteria is on the outside, and so when we sear it, like tuna is usually served seared on the outside, you're going to inactivate, you're going to kill that bacteria on the outside. So I don't get too worried about people eating rare prime rib or rare tuna because that searing has taken care of the, the bigger issue. I just happen to prefer cooked, you know, fully cooked meat. That's just maybe the way I was raised. But... Um, that's the difference. On the other hand, we don't suggest eating, well, tiger meat would be an example, which is uncooked ground beef, um, because the bacteria, which on the outside of the meat, whatever it was made from, you know, maybe chuck roast or whatever they ground up, um, all of the bacteria that was on the outside is now spread throughout. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the difference between the whole versus ground. Ground meats are always going to have a higher cooking temperature than the whole product. Except maybe in the case of ground chicken or turkey, all of those use the temperature of 165 Fahrenheit. But great question. Does coronavirus survive in the freezer? Um, <laughs> I don't, think, I don't think we know, and we're not too worried about coronavirus being associated with food anyway. So maybe I'll have my, my students see if they can find anything. I think this is so new that we don't know all the answers to that. But again, don't worry about coronavirus so much being associated with food. Simply follow these cooking steps. In general, 
um, bacteria, um, viruses most likely. The general types that we know a lot about will survive freezing, but they won't survive cooking. They will, you know, bacteria will survive refrigeration, but again, it won't survive cooking to the safe temperatures. All right, so now we're gonna keep going. Take a quick sip of tea. And we're going to talk a little bit about cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting because these terms have been thrown out a lot in the last couple, three weeks. And I just wanted to um, share with you what the differences are among these different terms. So we're going to discuss, think about this in your head, what you, what you think the definitions of these different items would be. So here is the answer to cleaning. Cleaning actually removes germs, dirt, and impurities. Just as we think, you know, washing off the dirt off your hands or the dirt off the onion or whatever it happens to be. Um, for our hands, we would use soap or detergent and water to physically remove the germs. But this process of cleaning does not kill germs. It removes them and therefore lowers their numbers and reduces the risk of spreading any infection. Now we go to another term, and this I've been hearing on and off on TV and on the radio, and um, some people are using disinfecting and sanitizing as the same word, and actually they're two different, two separate things. So sanitizing is typically the term we use when I've taught food safety classes to restaurants and industry people. Sanitizing lowers the number of germs on surfaces to a safe level, but not at the level of disinfecting. So it can be done with hot water. 171 is the typical temperature. If you're taking a food safety certification course, or you can use chemical agents at the correct combination. So um, iodine and quats would be some other examples. So the typical sanitizing concentration that we use is about a tablespoon of unscented chlorine bleach that's EPA registered, we'll add that, um, per gallon of water. And it's just warm water, it's not hot water. And if you wanted to sanitize a cutting board, for example, you'd flood that cutting board with the solution, allow it to stand for a few minutes, um, rinse it with clear water, and then air dry or cat dry. So that, again, same with when you pat dry vegetables, that physical drying also can remove further issues. But if you have sanitized your cutting board with the solution, you're going to be fine. Or you could put it through your dishwasher in a hot cycle. Um, the other word that we've been hearing a lot about is disinfecting. And this term Disinfecting means that the germs are killed on surfaces or objects. It does not clean those dirty surfaces. So we don't want to start with disinfecting. We have to start with cleaning. So we kill the germs on the surface after cleaning, and that further lowers the risk of spreading infection. Um, so you do want to follow the CDC guidelines. Keep in mind, again, that these are two different things. You know, disinfecting kills more germs than sanitizing does, and disinfection uses a much higher concentration of bleach than the other. So if we were to look at what a common disinfecting solution would be, um, it would be four teaspoons of the same bleach, EPA registered chlorine bleach, and it should say disinfecting. So if you have a bottle of bleach in your house, it also will have an expiration date on the bottle. So you probably will want to use that within that expiration date because then you know it's at that concentration. Um, you can see it's, it's higher. I said one tablespoon per gallon. This is four teaspoons in a quart. So that would be 16 teaspoons in a gallon or a lot. <laughs> um, alcohol can also be used as a disinfectant. It has a higher level of expected concentration or percent alcohol than the type of uh, sanitizer we'd use on our hands. So 70% alcohol for surfaces. And then there are lots of other EPA registered household disinfectants like Clorox, Lysol wipes. And again, I have a, I have a um, box or a 
container of Clorox wipes on my desk. And I don't think I'd ever read the fine print on, on that until recently. So I invite you, if you need reading glasses, put your reading glasses on and read that fine print because it tells you exactly what to do to disinfect. How long it should be on there, whether you need to wash off that, that bleach solution afterwards, which in many cases you do have to, for example, if you are using the chlorine and water solution. So follow the guidelines on the package or the box or the bottle. And I mean, those are small, <laughs> the small prints. So yeah, read the small print. Um, these are the items that really should be disinfected. That's according to CDC. Um, tables, doorknobs, night switches, light switches, uh, countertops, handles, desks, phones, keyboards, toilets, faucets, sinks. So as I've been sitting here at NDSU being one of two on my floor, uh, the custodian still comes around and cleans the outside door with disinfecting solution. So I feel pretty good about that, even though no one is in the building. Um, all right, so that sort of ends this part about cleaning and disinfecting, and I'm going to keep going, and I'll keep going as long as you want to ask me questions. We have quite a bit of material in this presentation, but hopefully this is helpful for you. So I'm next going to finish up my talk with some NDSU extension resources that I hope you take a look at. We've had these for a long time, but probably now more than ever, I hope that these are valuable to everyone. We have a series called Pinch and Pennies in the Kitchen. We have a series called Now Serving, which, you know, more family meals, lots of recipes, and we have a lot more. So please, um, please check out those resources. It's right at your fingertips. You can get it on your phone or a tablet or however you like to access information. So these are the, the titles we have in the Pinch and Penny series. Um, and if you download the PDF copy of my presentation on the Field to Fork website, you'll be able to just, they're hot links, so you can just open up the file and click on these titles. It'll take you right to it if you prefer to do it that way, or just go to NDSU Extension Food, the, just Google those terms, and that will take you to our main page. And then look under Food Preparation. So you can learn how to make soup from whatever you might have in your fridge or cupboard, uh, stir fries, omelets, um, dry beans are a great source of nutrition, fiber, protein, and they're very inexpensive. So that guide teaches you how to use that. Um, what's in your home pantry? Those are some general ideas for what to keep on hand. Uh, for most of us, it's a good idea to have at least a two week food supply you know, just, just in case. So that kind of gives you an idea of what are some good things to have in your cupboard, flour and broth and, you know, different things. Uh, another piece in the series of Pinch and Pennies is seven steps to making a quesadilla. Uh, if you have a lot of bread, there's four ways to use dale bread and a real fun one that you might want to try with the family members in your house. Uh, seven steps to making your own meal in a bowl. So that's that's kind of a fun one. Uh, if you have lots of cereal, there's one on using extra cereal, building a healthy lunch, and making your own pizza. And I think there's several more besides the ones I've shown you. So again, these are all there. And they have recipes, but they also have how to use what you have. So I think that makes them really valuable because you can use up some of the food you might have in your in your cupboard or freezer. Um, we have a series, and I just have a few of them on this slide. It's called Now Serving. So everything from shopping for family meals to meals with help from kids. If you are a parent out there who's homeschooling, as I mentioned earlier, these are some fun recipes to make with kids. Um, teenagers, there's a guide for that as well. And then we have a bunch called Tasty Healthy Meals on a Budget. And and I'm talking lots of, there's a lot of publications out there. So these are some of the ones in that series. This particular bunch um, goes week one, two, three, four, and five, and has your cost-saving tips, for example, menus, recipes, and I think some of them also have like a grocery list. So there, some of our students several years ago helped us assemble that. 
Um, we also have something kind of fun. This was a project I worked on with our family science specialist, Kim Bouchaw, who's the other person on the floor. Um, she created some fun conversation starters, and we also have a newsletter and Facebook page. But you can download these free conversation starters, and there's 60 different conversation starters. And if you ever run out of things to say, uh, you could pull some of those out. And for example, ask your family tonight, your friend, what's your superpower? What was your pit and your peach, your low point and high point of the day? So 60 of those, they're all online and they're on that Family Table website. So I hope you enjoy those. So these are what the, the Pinch and Pennies looks like or look like. So they're set up very nicely by our graphic design staff. And um, I hope you all stay well. I hope this was somewhat useful for you. And I want you to try to read the sentiment on our shirt. It says, all we need is glitter. <laughs> so hopefully that'll put you in a good mood, get out some glitter and uh, you know, celebrate the good things that we have in our life and stay well. I am ready to take questions now and open up the chat. So are there, which ones here have not been answered? Uh, so Julie, it looks like there's a few that, um, that have been answered by uh, some folks in the chat, but um, in case you have any comment on sanitizing cutting boards for plastic and wood, um, Rachel shared a link to USDA, but I don't know if you have anything else to add about that. Um, the thing to remember with wood and plastic cutting boards is that either one of those are certainly okay to use. The main thing with cutting boards is that at some point you might have to throw away the cutting boards if they get overused. Um, the best type of cutting boards are the ones that have a solid non-porous surface. So many food safety experts will recommend plastic or you know, something else that's non-porous, but even plastic after it's been used a long, long time and gets all those jagged little ridges from sharp knives, you know, it has a shelf life as well. So sanitizing them, um, you can certainly run the plastic ones through your dishwasher. The wood ones, I don't know that I would necessarily put that in a dishwasher, but you can certainly um, use that sanitizing solution I mentioned, which is a tablespoon bleach per gallon of water. Let it sit on the cutting board after you wash it, of course, for a few minutes and then rinse it off and dry it. So whatever kind of cutting board you use, make sure it's clean because that cutting boards are often the, you know, the problem becomes, um, they can become a source of cross-contamination. Thanks, Julie. Um, we had a question earlier about washing fruits and vegetables and using vinegar. And um, I think it was Jennifer said that she had heard that using vinegar helps remove some of the pesticides that aren't water soluble. Can you make, have any comment on that? Um, using vinegar isn't a common recommendation. They, they still only say to use running water. It certainly doesn't hurt if you want to use vinegar, but in terms of removing pesticides, um, I'm not seeing that as a general recommendation. But it doesn't hurt. I mean, it's not, not going to be uh, something that would harm you in any way. So Julie's uh, asking about tempered glass cutting board. She's asking, are they not recommended? you know, because of breakage, because of knives, dulling knives, or breaking them with knives? Um, really, the only, the only attributes you look for in a cutting board is something that's non-porous and easily cleanable. Um, tempered glass, yeah, the, the problem would be that they could break, and then you'd have a whole other level of hazard in your kitchen with broken glass. So most of the time what I see are the, you know, nice hard plastic or you know something that's non-breakable not porous and that type of thing but you know as long as that cutting board is intact and you can clean it yeah it's it's fine you can sanitize those just you can sanitize always the same way 
Cheryl had a question earlier, and I think um, somebody responded in the chat to that, but it was about, you know, air drying or drying with a towel or paper towel. I guess I've heard it both ways. Cheryl's heard it both ways. What is there a recommendation? Should you let things air dry when possible or always dry them with a paper towel or clean towel? Um, typically dishes, for example, we, we say to wash, rinse, you know, air dry. So probably air dry is the, the better thing to do, but you probably noticed that it did say to, to wipe off the, the produce with a paper towel. <laughs> um, that's just to take off anything that you might have missed. Um, as long as that paper towel is clean, that towel is clean, you're not, it's not a problem. It's kind of a, a preference, but you know, in food service, uh, they always have you air dry. And in your home, if you have a dishwasher, you probably have a drying cycle in your dishwasher. So that's totally fine. Okay. Yeah, and it looks like uh, Jean is, is backing that up. Norma's saying, I think soaking produce serves to cut bacterial load. Um, don't know if that's possible or not, but. <laughs> um, you guys are testing me. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, the soaking produce, it's it's not going to hurt you to put it put them in a in water, but again, we don't put them in soapy water. Just you can soak them a while if you want, use a brush. But the the rules that I shared with you are the ones from the Food and Drug Administration, not rules, just recommendations. So those that's what comes from the you know Produce Safety Act as well, and and that type of thing. But you're not going to harm yourself if you do things in different ways. I'm just giving you the general overall recommendations. Well, uh, we'll see if there's any other last minute questions, but I think um, most everything has been addressed. Um, Linda's asking, what about washing rice before cooking? Hmm. Uh, right. Washing rice before cooking. Um, what I would suggest with rice and beans, instead of necessarily washing it, would be to make sure that you pick out any stones or other particles that might be there. That would be the bigger issue because that could be a physical hazard. You could break a tooth, for example. Um, washing it, hmm, not, not a general recommendation to wash it. It doesn't hurt you to wash it. Same as it doesn't hurt you to wash the beans off before you cook them, but it's not a standard step that you, you know, they would recommend that we do with all of it. Make sure you pick out those little pieces of dirt that might have sneaked in because of where rice and beans are growing, get rid of the stones, and then cook it, and that's going to take care of any bacteria. Um, keep in mind, too, that rice is one of our fortified foods, so we, we also don't want to wash off the fortification before it has a chance to be with the rice as you cook it and be absorbed in that cooking water into the rice. So that'd be another thing I'd keep in mind. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Uh, great presentation. Thanks to uh, all of your helpers in the chat. They answered a whole ton of questions <laughs> with great research-based in information and recommendations from um, the USDA and other places. So I uh, really appreciate the presentation. A reminder uh, to everyone to uh, complete the survey when you get that uh, via email. And uh, thank you all for, for joining us and for all your great questions. Uh, it's been a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Feel free to reach out to me by email as well.